lithium ion batteries and energy storage has been a hot topic for the last couple of years. And um, I'm going to kind of go over kind of the fundamentals of operation for the lithium ion battery and then kind of give a historical context to see what's coming next and then give a brief review of um, layered oxide cathodes and kind of where they fit in the mix and then discuss some of the work that I've done that, and the lessons that we've learned from, from that work that can help in designing new layered oxide materials for lithium and sodium batteries. So the lithium ion battery is actually quite a complicated device, which is why most people specialize on one component, either the cathode, anode, electrolyte, or separator. Um, and then of course, there are the ambitious few that tackle several parts. But essentially this battery is assembled in the discharge state. So you have a transition metal oxide cathode, which is uh, pre-lithiated during synthesis. And then it's assembled with a graphite anode, which is just uh, you know these layers of C6. And uh, upon charge, the lithium makes its way from the cathode to the anode to lithiate the graphite and give it a similar electrochemical potential to lithium metal and thus a large operating voltage. So you can see on this sort of voltage capacity diagram, uh, as you charge, the voltage goes up, as you discharge, the voltage comes down, and then the over potential between the charge and discharge voltage should uh, attempt it to be minimized minimize to um, limit your energy losses. And then just to give an idea of how complicated this device can be on the uh, fundamental level, I've provided kind of the electronic structure diagram of each component. Um, and then, you know, during uh, what happens when it charges and discharges, you can see here that the electrochemical potential, the Fermi level of the cathode um, increases in distance from the Fermi level of graphite to give you such a large operating voltage of around uh, 3.8 to 4 volts in uh, the typical lithium-ion battery, say, that might power your phone with. And so to give some historical context, uh, chemical intercalation has really been known since the 1960s. So people were, um, I think the French primarily, and some uh, there was a fellow in Germany, that were working on um, lithiating or sodiating transition metal sulfides with a laminar structure, so layers of uh, MS2, um, and li chemically lithiating or sodiating that to, uh, to obtain, you know, LIX, S, uh, MS2 materials. And then it wasn't until 1976 when uh, Stan Winningham discovered you could do this reaction electrochemically, and he demonstrated it with titanium disulfide to give a battery that was about 2.1 volts. He used titanium sulfide as the cathode and lithium metal as the anode. And then sometime in the late 1970s, Michel Armand uh, proposed the rocking chair battery where he used two intercalation electrodes as opposed to using a lithium metal electrode. He used, uh, I believe it was lithiated graphite and non-lithiated graphite to give a battery of about three volts. And this was revolutionary in the fact that all the lithium started in the structure of a material and just kind of shuttled back and forth. And then that led, uh, when you know, John Goodenough, my PhD advisor and current postdoc advisor, uh, started working on the problem. His expertise in transition metal oxides led him to the discovery of lithium cobalt oxide. Um, since Armand had already demonstrated you could start with pre-lithiated materials, uh, Goodenough knew which pre-lithiated transition metal oxide was, was the best option. And so this lithium cobalt oxide gave a much higher voltage than titanium disulfide, so he was able to show a, um, a battery with about four volts, an operating voltage of four volts, which really led to, um, it wasn't until a decade later, but it led to commercial entrance, interest once Akira Yoshino paired it with a graphite anode so you didn't have to worry about lithium metal dendrites coming from, from the anode anymore. And then in uh, 1997, good enough again, demonstrated LIFEPO4 as a, as a new structure cathode material. So um, instead of intercalation, it was actually a phase change reaction when it's uh, lithiated or delithiated. And um, so since the 2010s, people have really been refocusing on the layered structure, uh, but this time instead of cobalt, really focusing on in, in increasing the nickel content in these materials since it gives a higher energy density. Lithium cobalt oxide kind of has a critical flaw because the cobalt 3D uh, electron band overlaps the oxygen 2P band. So once you delithiate more about 55% of the lithium from the structure, 
uh, it becomes very thermally unstable. So any sort of uh, slight heating can actually cause the structural transition to uh, spinel material, which is not does not perform nearly as well electrochemically. And so with lithium really being kind of the prime mover in the last few years, people are starting to look towards sodium because it's much more naturally abundant and more inexpensive. Um, and additionally, still trying to tailor uh, current lithium ion chemistries to really narrow, to really tailor and improve their performance to, um, to continue sort of the electrification of, of uh, portable electronics that we've been seeing. Um, additionally, grid storage is becoming more and more of interest, uh, which is primarily where sodium ion is believed to have um, a lot of advantages because most of the materials are a little lower in voltage, uh, but with its, with its abundance and costs, uh, the, you know, its lower voltage is less of a concern. And so, as I mentioned, you know, people are really still focused on tailoring lithium layered cathode materials. And uh, they are a very good combination of capacity and voltage. So they give a very large energy density when compared to other materials. Um, they can be synthesized easily. They're stable in air. Um, and so really that's why a lot of people like to work with these materials. And um, just to give a little bit of background on the structure, I mean, you have these alternating layers of MO2 with lithium sitting in the van der Waals gap. And uh, specifically for lithium, it can occupy kind of two sites in this van der Waals gap, either octahedral or tetrahedral site. And uh, as we'll see later, you really, you, you know, it's more preferred for lithium to kind of sit in those octahedral sites. Um, you don't need to worry too much about phase changes for lithium, except for at extreme levels of deintercalation, where the layers can either get too close together to where the structure collapses, or uh, in certain cases where, as I mentioned, for lithium cobalt oxide, where the electronic structure um, kind of promotes, uh, you know, structural transition um, upon, you know, slight heating. And so, as I mentioned, uh, the last few years, people have really been focusing on getting nickel, more nickel into the structure because it doesn't have the same problem of cobalt. The, three, the nickel 3D band does not overlap the oxygen 2P band, so you don't have to worry about thermal evolution. But the primary problem with nickel is that it's a similar size as lithium, so you really have trouble forming a fully ordered layered structure. You actually get a lot of anti-site defects with lithium and nickel. Um, but these can be suppressed either with elemental doping or specific synthetic strategies. Um, and so, you know, some people work on these transition metal gradients where you have different levels of each transition metal after doping throughout the particle, um, as kind of demonstrated in this work by Yang Cook Sung. And um, to kind of tackle the problem, as I mentioned, of, of structural collapse, you know, at high levels of delithiation, people have worked on structure pillaring, substituting something less mobile, such as magnesium, for lithium to really pillar the layers, the transition metal layers apart from one another. Um, and then one of the more recent findings, uh, people have actually tried to take advantage of sort of the overlapping um, transition metal electron band with oxygen to actually find that you can reversibly uh, reduce and oxidize um, lattice oxygen in the material. Unfortunately, you get a really large voltage hysteresis, so the, the practical applications for this strategy are a little bleak at the moment, but uh, continuing to work on these materials, um, there's already been some reports of uh, you know, high voltage, very low voltage hysteresis ma materials for sodium. Um, so hopefully we can, you know, continue working on that problem and, and solve it for lithium. But really this slide is just to show that although, the, you know, layer transition metal oxides for lithium have been around since, you know, the 1970s and really broke into prominence in the 1980s, there's still a lot to work on and people are really still working hard on trying to optimize these materials. And so for layered, um, sodium cathode materials, not sure why these transitions are here. Sorry about that. Um, you know, you have a lot. You have a few more things to worry about than for lithium, which which kind of hinders their commercial applications now. But as we'll see later, uh, some significant work has been done to to um, improve upon these materials. So sodium was actually explored uh, in its layered oxide form long before lithium, at least electrochemically. Uh, Claude Delmas in um, in Bordeaux, France, 
did a lot of work on the sodium layered oxides back in the 70s. But one of the primary problems is you get the structural transition from the MO2 layers gliding as the sodium is removed from the structure. So you'll get sodium sitting from these kind of octahedral sites to a prismatic site. And additionally, sodium has a lot more columbic interactions with itself than lithium does. So you get a lot of sodium ordering within the layer. And these two phenomena really um, have a prominent effect on the electrochemical curve of these materials. As you can see, um, you get these voltage steps that really make their use in practical batteries um, almost impossible. People like to know what the what the voltage curve is going to look like and they prefer smooth curves that you know smooth sloping curves rather than these kind of staircase uh type electrochemical curves but a lot of you know again with energy storage and batteries being in such uh such demand in recent years uh people have really refocused their efforts on trying to suppress these tr structural transitions and sodium ordering um, the two primary methods that they're doing that are via elemental doping and um, trying to induce transition metal vacancies. Um, so as you can see here, this voltage curve is much smoother already with, the in, with uh, a few induced transition metal vacancies. And so um, as I showed in the overview, I've, I've I worked on uh, two systems. So one is a lithium nickel tellurate system and the other one's going to be a sodium nickel tellurate system. And although the presence of tellurium kind of hinders the practical applica applicability of these materials, um, there are still some structure proper property relationships that we can glean design principles from for future, um, you know, cathode materials and structures. So for the lithium nickel tellurate system, I was able to synthesize three different structures, all with the same composition, which is pretty unusual for these types of materials. Um, but the only one that could be made through direct solid state synthesis was this disordered rock salt structure where the tellurium is ordered, but there's uh, almost complete anti-site defect, anti defect between the nickel two plus lithium and uh, vacancies. So the, there's not a clear percolation pathway for the lithium to intercalate and deintercalate into the material. And so um, after you know, numerous attempts at trying to tailor the solids, the direct solid state synthesis route to obtain a layered structure. Um, it became clear that that was, you know, most likely not going to happen. So instead I ion exchanged, um, you know, using molten lithium nitrate at 300 degrees C, uh, lithium for sodium, since you can make the sodium to nickel to TE of six material directly. And, um, you know, after solving the diffraction pattern to obtain the structure, it turns out that this gives a T2 layered structure. So T stands for tetrahedral. So lithium is sitting in tetrahedral sites in the inner uh, slab space. And two just simply means that there's two transition metal layers um, in the unit cell. I've extended it a bit here for the sake of um, picturing the structure. And then the hashtag is sort of a, a special symbol in this type of no notation. Um, which just means that the oxygen packing is slightly shifted, which is typical in ion exchange material, ion exchange layered materials anyways. Um, and then DFT calculations actually showed that this T2 layered structure was uh, very close in energy to an O prime three layered structure. So O meaning uh, oxygen is sitting in octahedral sites in the van der Waals space. And then the prime means that there's a distortion to the typical hexagonal unit cell. Um, in this case, it's induced by sort of this honeycomb ordering from, um, you know, you have six nickels surrounding a tellurium in the transition metal space. Uh, but there are several other factors that can induce this monoclinic distortion, um, you know, particularly Jan Teller distortion, you know, Jan Teller active ions that can induce a cooperative Jan Teller distortion are, are particularly prevalent in 3D transition metal oxides. Um, and so after seeing that result from DFT that this structure should be similar in energy, I, I tried heating up the T2 layered structure and that, um, you know, very fortunately that gave the O prime three structure at about, uh, I believe it was 600 degrees C is when the phase transformation starts to happen. So uh, that also gives a pretty good indication that this T2 layered material is not uh, particularly stable, which I'll touch on a bit more later.
And so uh, since I'm from a, a battery lab, essentially, you know, the natural thing to do after figuring out each of the crystal structures of these materials was to test them electrochemically and see, you know, how much lithium I could insert and extract from the material reversibly. And um, as you can see, each of these materials is actually has a quite low specific capacity. So, I mean, the typical uh, layered lithium oxide would have, you know, 150 to 200 milliamp hours per gram. And you can see we're coming in well under a third of that. Um, and the theoretical capacity of, the, of this composition is 150. Um, so you can see we're, we're not even removing really a third of the lithium. But uh, surprisingly, the capacity fade for the disordered rock salt, as I mentioned, there wasn't a clear percolation pathway for lithium to get in and out of the material. It showed the best electrochemical performance, which isn't saying much for this system, but um, that was still quite a surprising result. And then uh, the O'3 structure came in second, which still has a really significant capacity fade, but its uh, electrochemical curve more or less stays the same in terms of shape. And so the shape of the electrochemical curve can really give some indication on uh, what's happening with the structure of the material. So since there's no um, sort of no series of plateaus or no significant change in, in the electrochemical curve, uh, at least its shape for these, the disordered rock salt in the O3 layer structure, it's a good indication that there's no um, extreme structural transformation occurring. But for the TE2 layered structure, we can see that the curve is, you know, drastic, you know, the voltage hysteresis is increasing. And, uh, you know, eventually after 50 cycles, there's almost no electrochemical activity at all, which is a, um, an indication that there is some structural degradation or structural change happening. And so to probe, um, we took two routes to kind of probe this structural transformation. So one was uh, DFT calculations for nickel transfer in the material. Since, as I mentioned before, uh, making ordered nickel materials, ordered nickel layered oxides with lithium is difficult since they're similar in size. And the other one was uh, ex situ x-ray diffraction. So the uh, ex situ x-ray diffraction didn't show any structural change for the disordered rock salt or the O3 layered structure as we expected. But for the T2 layered structure, we actually see um, see a, sh a pretty drastic shift that only becomes uh, more prominent with extended cycling. And we attribute this to the formation of an O2 layered structure. So essentially, once you start cycling lithium, all of the lithium and tetrahedral sites shift to octahedral sites. And um, there's sort of a formation of a secondary phase, which we uh, believe may be O6, but it was really hard to tell since the sort of the peaks from that secondary phase weren't very prominent. But a similar phenomenon happened in, um, in some work by Danny Carlia and Claude Del Moss back in the early 2000s when they ion exchanged um, you know, the P2 sodium cobalt oxide for lithium to obtain this unusual oxygen stacking. So normally lithium cobalt oxide is an O3, um, but they obtain this kind of O2 oxygen packing. And uh, when they cycled it, they also obtained sort of a secondary phase that they couldn't identify. Uh, so, yeah, we, we felt very confident that this kind of structural degradation was responsible for the, um, the demolition of the electrochemical performance for the T2 material. And, um, you know, the nickel transfer uh, calculations from DFT showed that really um, nickel can transfer quite, quite easily in all of these structures. Um, because there's a, a clear pathway and also because the octahedral sites that lithium occupies is, you know, just a, essentially just the right size for nickel to, to sit into. Um, so you can see these activation energy barriers of, are all around 0.85 and uh, that's really not very high, especially when you start um, applying currents to your battery. Um, so really uh, nickel two plus is kind of, the downfall of these materials in terms of, um, you know, their cyclability. And um, additionally, since there's already pre-existing vacancies in each structure, it can, it can diffuse essentially as soon as you start cycling the material. So it can actually block the diffusion pathways um, almost immediately. Because unless you oxidize enough nickel two plus to nickel three plus, um, 
it's it's going to be able to diffuse and, and block the lithium within the lithium layers of the layered materials. And then the pre-existing anti-site defects of the uh, disordered rock salt structure, um, you know, already block its diffusion pathway. And so for sodium, uh, you know, we have a bit more promising outlook on these materials. Um, so the sodium-2, nickel-2, TeO-6 composition and sodium-4, nickel-1, TeO-6 composition had already been synthesized. But really what I was trying to do with this sodium-3, nickel-1.5, TeO-6 composition was keep all the sodium within the sodium layer and induce nickel um, vacancies. So as I mentioned before, transition metal vacancies are one of the methods people are exploring to try and reduce sodium ordering in those layered, um, layered phase transitions for sodium materials. But uh, it turns out that sodium actually backfills the transition metal layer and creates sodium vacancies in the sodium layer. And um, so this was a bit disappointing from the point of view of uh, wasn't what we were hoping for, but um, you know we you know the material was still a novel composition and we um, were able to make it directly through solid state synthesis. So you know we still wanted to evaluate kind of what would this sodium ordering you know since there's so little sodium in the transition metal layer, what would its ordering look like, or is there just complete uh, complete mixing between the nickel and sodium. Um, and so that really can't be gleaned from laboratory x-ray diffraction. Uh, I mean, I was able to solve the structure to an extent, um, you know, using rebuild refinement and, and those types of methods. But um, all that could really tell me was that it was a layered structure, O prime three. So there is a monoclinic distortion to the unit cell because of the honeycomb ordering again with tellurium, and in this case, the sodium and nickel. But really, it didn't tell me a whole lot about the sodium positions um, within the transition metal layer. And so for that, we had to turn to, apologize for the transitions, um, to solid state uh, paramagnetic NMR. And so this was actually illuminating on the sodium ordering. So you can see uh, essentially the positive shifts in the NMR spectra can be attributed to the two sodium sites within the sodium layer, but then the sort of neutral and negative peaks can be attributed to sodium in the MO2 layer. So if you would assume complete mixing, you would assume uh, for the sodium in the transition metal layer, you would expect to see a much larger peak for three nickel nearest neighbors. And then it would kind of be the reverse where you have a moderate peak for two and then one would be the smallest. But it's actually the opposite. Um, what we observe is the opposite. So uh, this really shows that sodium really likes to sort of cluster in the MO2 layer, as you can see in the schematic, and um, sort of make these, you know, these kind of sodium, sodium chains. Um, and then, of course, just the fact that there's such a little amount of sodium in the layer doesn't means they can't, you know, continuously chain together. But um, it was a very interesting finding to see that sodium likes to cluster together. Um, and of course, the tellurium remains ordered and you can't have anti-site defect there because it's such a, a large charge difference. But uh, nevertheless, this was an interesting finding for us structurally. And um, we wondered what kind of effect it would have on the electrochemical performance of the material. And this really validated um, kind of the findings we had from the Rietveld refinements. Um, you know, I did two refinements, one of sodium completely in the sodium layer, and then one where sodium was doped into the transition metal layer. And the, uh, the refinements indicated that this, uh, you know, the vacancies were forming in the sodium layer, but the paramagnetic NMR, you know, definitively uh, confirmed that result. And so the electrochemical performance of the sodium material was actually quite good. I mean, we can see that the uh, composite, you know, voltage versus composition curve is completely smooth. So there's not really any indication of structural change occurring. And it, uh, its cyclability is quite nice. You can see the capacity fade over the first 50 cycles is not very severe. And, um, you know, just to ensure kind of our, our picture of what was happening structurally, was correct. I mean, these layered sodium materials are well known to have structural transitions. Um, there was some, in, we performed an inoperando experiment 
And it actually turns out that upon very early in the desodiation process, we get a structural transition from O prime three to P prime three. So um, sodium is shift is dragging the transition metal layers to uh, form prismatic sites so that it's uh, instead of octahedral sites. But once that initial structural transition occurs, the sodium composition actually never gets back to the point where you reform the O prime three phase. Um, and it turns out if you use a potentiostatic hold at low voltage, you can reintercalate enough sodium to do so. But in practical cycling conditions, you essentially have this uh, structural transformation that occurs after removing about 0 0.09 or 0 0.06 sodium. And then it just stays as a P prime three structure through the duration of cycling, which explains why you don't see any further voltage steps in its electrochemical curve. Um, we also believe this is the reason why you don't see any severe structural degradation because you don't have the MO2 layers dragging back and forth upon repeated cycling. And so really just to summarize kind of the lessons that were, you know, we, we gleaned from both the lithium and the sodium systems um, is that, you know, lithium, the lithium nickel tellurates are very structurally diverse. As I showed, you know, you can make three different structures all of the same composition. But um, nickel two plus is really uh, detrimental to performance, which is unfortunate since the nickel two plus, three plus, and three plus, four plus redox couples are very close, typically very close together. So you can try to take advantage of that additional capacity for one transition metal. Um, but unfortunately, it's it's too similar in ionic radius to lithium to really be able to stabilize uh, in a transition metal site and not have to worry about, um, you know, nickel two plus diffusion. And then additionally, um, you know, we found in this study that the T2 structure where lithium is in tetrahedral sites is pretty unfavorable. Um, you know, the structure just isn't stable and this kind of confirms other findings on the T2 materials. So uh, really that's just a confirmation of work that had already been done. So you really want lithium to start in an octahedral site and you want to avoid nickel two plus. And those are lessons that we can, we can take from this and move forward when looking at uh, new chemistries for lithium layered oxides. And then for sodium, we had a bit more exciting finding that sodium can be substituted for a 3D transition metal, which was surprising given you know, the large size difference between sodium and nickel two plus. But it's actually, if you, if you can create, um, if you can dope just a little bit to the point where there's not extended ordering throughout the bulk of the material, uh, it's actually very favorable for its electrochemical performance and it can suppress, uh, not only suppress the sodium ordering within the sodium layers, but it can also suppress those, um, you know, those layered layered phase transitions where the MO2 layers glide and it really gives a nice elect smooth electrochemical curve reminiscent of uh, the commercial lithium layered oxides that are in use today. And with that, I'd really like to thank, um, you know, my collaborators, of course, my professor, John Goodenough. Uh, he's been the most wonderful mentor I could really ever have asked for. And then uh, Dr. Yayan Seymour, who spent some time in the Hankelman group, and he was really, um, he's really to credit for the DFT calculations. And he was also a huge help in in the NMR uh, interpretation that I discussed for the sodium material. And then um, Dr. Yu Tao Li, who is the wealth of knowledge, but unfortunately I didn't have a picture of him to include here. And of course, Dr. Henkelman for, um, for his assistance in the DFT calculations as well. And then um, from the University of Bordeaux, uh, Professor Claude Delmas, who was really nice enough to let me stay in his lab for a couple of weeks. And, and he worked with him on the sodium material that I presented today. And then um, his student, John baptiste Sand, who uh, really showed me the ropes when I was visiting their laboratory. Uh, and then of course, I have to acknowledge the University of Texas at Austin for giving me a wonderful place to work and perform research. Uh, and then the Welch Foundation and the University of Depart the U.S. Department of Energy for, uh, for their funding to that supported my work. Um, and with that, I just want to reiterate, it's been wonderful being in such, you know, tremendous company.